a small college, only yeah. 150 people overlooking the beach. And sometimes we'd go up to Blinderfest in York and we'd, we'd kind of, you know, sing and drink. And, and we'd go on uh, uh, marches to London, you know, Margaret Thatcher, the milk snatcher. We were, we were protesting. Um, it was quite communist led at the college, which I thought that to take the ship with a proletariat was a little bit heavy for me. So I joined the anarchist group. There was more free thinking and I became you know, all property is theft and I became Proudhon. That's what was my, my readership. And we were a small cell, but we were, we were, we were, we were deadly. We were deadly. <laughs> Out but, to cause but, trouble. You know, but this communist group was so dipped, dipped, you know, you know, it was kind of, here's the party line. And then for, for some of us, that was... We came to we came to college to to be a free thinker, not kind of told how to think, and you know. So we read Marx and we studied Marx and whatnot, but we we saw Marx was you know on the road to anarchy. You know? Okay, well, it's going to be an interesting. This is going to be an interesting listen, isn't it? <laughs> indeed, indeed. My guest today is the educational psychologist Dr Rob Long who sits on the National Council for SEPTA which is an organisation that aims to promote the social and emotional well-being of children and young people. This episode was possibly my favourite to record because Rob is just constantly fascinating, he's very funny, he's often slightly unpredictable, he's got ideas overflowing out of his brain all the time i could have got off on so many tangents with him he's interesting he's cares about what he's talking about yeah i mean basically i could have i could have listened to him for hours on end but i won't go on about it because i'll let the man speak for himself so without any further ado here is the first ever episode of wonders of the world and the phenomenal dr rob long I find that kind of um, of late, I've kind of been pushing uh, positive psychology. So I've been trying to say that you need you need to address the 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 leak in the boat. So if children have got anxiety or depression and whatnot, there are things that psychology can put in place to help and everything like that. But equally, the child is going forward with the sails of the little boat, and therefore you've got to address their character strengths, their, their signature strengths, you know, what's good and things like that. So I feel that psychology, you know, did become over-focused on and, and very successfully on anxiety, depression, etc., etc. And I've got no problem with that, but I, I'm, I'm uplifted by kind of how you, how you can see the, the strengths that people have in coping. So I think, I, I suppose at one point in, in my career, I thought I would go towards being a politician. I thought I would become politically, you know, I, I became politically aware. And I, I, there was a time when I thought I would go down that road. And then I think for various reasons, I ended up focusing on psychology, but it's more kind of um, psychology that tries to liberate and psychology that tries to look upwards to change the system that children and young people are trying to cope with. So. I feel that kind of, I'm, not, I'm not just wanting to address the specifics. I want to look to the broader, wider context. And I, I think it, it kind of gives me inspiration to feel that you can be part of promoting change, that you are challenging people that just read one newspaper that always says it's individuals at fault, when in actual fact there are people like me trying to say, hold on, the system is unfair. So I, I I'm, I'm energized by the fact that you know, you know you have a part to play in pushing and challenging the system to say it's not the way you're trying to present it so I, um, I'm all for kind of having a, a critical edge to psychology does that, does that yeah yeah so I think yeah you've sort of um, reflected back a little bit what I was saying which is yeah there's sort of a bit of frustration sometimes with the world and the way that certain people say perceive things certainly you know troubled young people you can feel frustrated about that but overall there's a there's a positive aspect to the work that you're doing that makes you feel that you know that at, at its best i suppose makes you feel quite uplifted about the world which is a great place hopefully to start our, our show today so your first wonder of the world that you've chosen is a place 
And again, I'm, I'm not going to try and uh, pronounce this place, but it's somewhere in North Wales. Tell us about the, the place that you've chosen for your first wonder of the world today, Bob. I've chosen Harlech, Harlech, which is North Wales, and was a college, a college that I got accepted to have a place. I mean, up until then, I, mean, I was in my early 20s, I was kind of um, doing various jobs and everything. I left school as something of a, a failure. Um, I left with about two GCSEs, two O-levels in those days. I think I had a report that said, Robert has made really good progress in this subject this year, and we feel it's a good time for him to give it up. So I, I kind of, I, I, I was kind of branded, you know, I, I was difficult at school, I was difficult at home and whatnot. So um, after various jobs and everything, I decided I wanted to work with people. There was something in me that was unsettled. I, I was going into bookshops and buying philosophy books by Bertram Russell. I mean, books that I didn't understand, but I seemed to be drawn to them kind of thing. So I wanted to work with people and a, f a friend of the family said, you need to get qualifications, etc. So I, I looked around and there was this college in North Wales very left-wing, very trade union and everything. And I, I managed to get a place. And I went there and I, I couldn't believe it. I, I, you know, kind of, I suddenly, I was reading philosophy, psychology, politics, sociology, these, these great thinkers, you know, kind of, you know, Hobbes, Rousseau, Machiavelli, Freud, all of these people were talking straight to me. And I suddenly found in education that the fulfilled part of me, and I, I, I just took off with it. I, I kind of, uh, I couldn't get enough. I was, I was just rolling along with these ideas. I, I can't, I can't, it, it was such a place. It was a small college, about 120 students. And, and we, we just, we just lived ideas. Uh, I met, I met a guy there, uh, Faraday, that was almost like a brother I'd never had. And we, and we bonded and we kind of talked and we, we drank hard, we worked hard. It was, it was fantastic. It was fantastic. And for two years, I, I studied there um, and I got a diploma in social studies. I, I passed everything well. And I suddenly found that I could apply to universities. So, so it, it was a crossroads for me. You know, Harlech gave me this kind of uh, uh, qualification that I applied for all the Welsh universities and I was accepted. I was accepted at Cardiff, Bangor, Aberystwyth, Swansea. And I, you know, this lad that was kind of labelled as kind of pretty stupid and thick, suddenly I was going to be a university man. And I, I, I couldn't believe it. And when, when I went to Cardiff, I can still remember walking over the footbridge to the university, carrying a briefcase and almost having an, an out of body experience with a voice saying, and where are you going to? And the little me said, I'm going to university. I'm going to university. I was the first in my family, you know, kind of to go yeah. to university and everything. So, you know, so Harlech, I, I, I still get a passion. I mean, it's so sad that the, the college is no longer there. It, it was designed for, um, it, it was one in Scotland, one in England, one in Wales, and it was for kind of late developers or people that had messed up or not got it right first time round. And I went there as a mature student. And it, it kind of, it changed everything. It, you know, after that, um, most of my 20s and I was a student all my friends were getting married having children and I was seen as a perpetual student mm -hmm. and I loved it I loved it do you think that if you hadn't rocked up at Harlech do you think you would have found that love for education or that love for ideas and all those things do you think you would have found them somewhere else would you think there was something particularly unique about that place that that, that gave you that opportunity does that make sense it it does. I mean, you, you, it's hard to say what you know what what would have happened if I mm. if I if you know taken a different pathway. I mean, I think there would have been a lot of frustration. I mean, um, um, I think I would have been searching for something, and it would always be a new part of me. I think I could have ended up in jobs that didn't give me a lot of satisfaction, that paid the rent, that kind of thing. So I, I think I would have been a different me. I would have been a very different me. Uh, I think Harlech was, it, it was just kind of, it was a crossroads, uh, you know, it was just amazing. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have had the same opportunities because it gave me the ticket that said you can go to university. And I think that would have been a hard, hard push to, you know, get more O-levels. Because I'd gone back to night school, I'd gone back to a FE college and I'd, I'd increased my kind of O-levels from two to, to four. And I went to a teacher training college and I wanted to be a teacher and I was told I couldn't uh, apply because I didn't have five O-levels. 
So whether I would have gone back and got another one, mm-hmm. I think there was a degree of resentment that, you know, kind of, I was, I was beginning to show that there was more to me than the path I was on. I needed to be on a different path. I think for some people that I've spoken to in the past who struggle academically, certainly in their younger years, they often have a period where they have sort of mixed feelings towards um, education or academia, where on the one hand they sort of crave it and they crave the learning and the experiences, but on the other hand there's sort of a, a, a little touch of resentment or um, the, the institutions can make them feel quite uncomfortable and, and so there's this sort of, you know, they want, to, they want to be a part of that. There's a sort of natural thirst for knowledge, but also a sort of, you know, um, finding that the, the places where you would normally go to get knowledge can be quite challenging or unfriendly places for people who, who struggle academically. It sounds like Harlech um, was able to make sure that you felt comfortable and, and you know, encouraged to go in and yeah. embrace those experiences despite, you know, your, your 2 levels or whatever it was that didn't yeah. really matter. I, th- I think you're right. Um, I mean, at Harlech, there were people from a similar social background. Mm-hmm. You know, so when you went to Cardiff, Cardiff was also a university that had a, high, had a high proportion of mature students, people who'd given up work and come back to education. Um, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I always remember um, there was a book by Richard, Richard Hoggett, I think, called Uses of Literacy. And the last chapter, it talked about how when you get an education, you can end up, you've got a foot in two camps. Intellectually, you're on the middle class side of things and you're analyzing ideas and everything. But emotionally, you still have your roots in a kind of working class tradition. And it can be that you can feel alienated or, you know, kind of w- with the middle class side that intellectually you're, you're at one with them, but emotionally there's a gap. And then when you go back to your roots, emotionally you're happy, but intellectually you might find that you're, you know, you're looking for more ideas and everything. And it's, it's that kind of tension, which, which is part of life, isn't it? You know, so I, th- I think you're right that kind of, I was lucky at Harlech that we were all much of a muchness, you know, kind of my, my friend Faraday, he was like a, an ex-railway worker, you know, so we, we were very much on the same emotional, you know, pathway. So, but I think, I think you're right, it can be, it can, I, th- I think they were kind of um, relationships that broke up, you know, where the one went to Harlech and the other one stayed back at home and the one moved on and the other one didn't kind of thing. So at that stage, I was, sing- I was still uh, single. I was still, you know, I, I, was, I was a student. I was a student. So I was uh, very happy, you know, I had a mature, I had a full grant. I mean, I was a very happy boy. I kind of... I couldn't believe it that you know I was being paid to learn. Well, let's move on to your second one. Then let's fast forward in time. So we go forward to your memory, which was um, you receiving your doctorate. So your second one, really well, is, is you receiving your um, grad- your graduation, and your fa- you said your family will be in there for you receiving your doctorate. So yes. what, what, what's the gap between those two things, time wise? Um, me growing up. Yeah. Me meeting my wife. My wife, Christine, because I, when I left Harlech to go to Cardiff, I studied to work regularly in a psychiatric hospital. And my wife was on an occupational therapy course, so we met there. So that was a, a big, you know, kind of uh, a, a huge, you know, mega thing. I was not just going to university, but I settled down into a, a relationship. Um, I got my degree. I trained to be a teacher. After so many years, I, t- I crossed over to train. I got a master's degree at Exeter University and I became a ed psych. Um, I have two, two uh, amazing children, uh, Jenny and Joseph. Um, uh, and we lived in Exeter and then we moved to Wolverhampton. You know, so I studied, I, uh, studied to be a, ma- a master's degree. Then I kind of um, uh, went to Wolverhampton, a fantastic experience there. The guy there, Bruce Keel, allowed me to develop my interest in kind of that if I did some work in a school on self-esteem, I then ran a course on self-esteem. If I helped this one child about anxiety, I developed the framework for teachers to learn about anxiety. So I was given free reign and I started to write little booklets and wear fancy ties. I studied, I studied, so that, that was fantastic. And then when I came back, um, I, I was like a working class lad. There was two thirds up a mountain. I had a, I had a bachelor's degree. I had a master's degree. I wanted a doctorate. I, I wanted a doctorate. I, I kind of, I come this far. 
So I went back to Cardiff University. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. What, so when you say you wanted a doctorate and you were two thirds up this mountain, what, what at that point, what's driving you to, for, for that last third of the mountain? What, what's, what's motivating you there? I think I think my background that I've been kind of, you know, kind of um, at school, I was a failure. I was not mm -hmm. seen to be particularly bright. Um, I, I had other physical issues. Therefore, I was going to be a clerk. You know, it was all kind of like a negative script was laid out for me. So were you proving a point to yourself or other people or both? I, I think both, very much both. I mean, proving to myself that I, I was capable and to other people to say, you know, look what I've achieved over and above what you expected from me. So I think it was, it was a, dual, a dual thing, yeah? So, so by the time I went back to Cardiff University to study, which in itself was an amazing experience, going back and sitting in the same room in the same lecture theatre, which I had when I was a, a radical, long-haired, you know, bright spark kind of thing. Here, here I was now mature, married with children and a mortgage. But anyway, I, I went back and I studied. No, I mean, going back to one of your points, you know, the, the institution, you know, of education and everything was, was bourgeois. Remember, I was at this college, yes? We were to change the system, not support it. So when we graduated, we were not going to go to a, a ceremony to be, you know, patted on the head and everything like that. We, we were there to change the system, not, not support the system, yeah? So I never went to my bachelor's ceremony. I boycotted it. I never went to my master's ceremony. But when I got my doctorate, by then, I suppose a little bit of the radical side had been blunted and whatnot. And I saw this was an opportunity for a party, a huge celebration. Um, you, you wear the kind of vermin, the, you know, kind of the, the velvet hat. I wore mine for a fortnight after, you know, people would see me walking around saying there, that must be Dr. Rob there. Yeah. So do you get, uh, do you get a special uniform at that point? Is it, is there an upgrade on the hat? Is a special oh, like, oh, colours oh, and stuff? Yeah, the the colours, I'm, I'm looking at me here. I don't, I don't, I don't know if you could see it, if I could take it off the wall, but I've got a robe, it's red and green, and, and it's a floppy velvet hat, you know. Why well, is it out? Well, why, why, why is it out? Do you, do you wear this regularly around the house now? Or you got, well, in my is mind, it, I do. I've got <laughs> photographs. I mean, in the kitchen. Oh, okay, got, okay, that makes more sense, yeah. With me and my family, yes. Yeah, so, so, so we hired, we hired a kind of... Um, uh, it sounds silly, but there's a massive greenhouse next door to us. We hired that for a party. We got a live band. We, we did everything. We, we, I had 70, 80 people there. Uh, my children were there. We had the, the music I loved and everything. And the, and the kind of, you know, that when they sang, I, you know, that we get by with a little help from our friends and whatnot. Yeah, I mean, my, my Jenny, my Joseph was there. My Chris was there. We, you know, you know it was something I'd worked so hard and dreamt of. Dreamt of. <laughs> It took a long time to get, but I kind of, um, it, it was it getting to the top. Sounds absolutely magic. I really, I really don't want to trivialise it in any way, but I've, I've got to ask the, the doctor bit of your title then, how often do you throw that around and are there, are there times when you, you know, particularly enjoy introducing yourself as Dr. Long or is that, is that not a thing? I used to have it on my swimming pool card that I was a doctor. Um, I think it's good. It's good that when I um, give talks or write something, I think people. It shows that I've I've studied. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I do use it professionally. Um, I'm, kind of, I'm a tutor now. I mean, can you believe that? I'm a tutor for a. I've joined an organisation called SEBDA, which is Social Emotional Behavioural Difficulties Association, and they're linked to uh, a, a course that's run by Oxford Brooks in Oxford on social and emotional mental health issues and I'm a tutor on this distance learning course and um, so I, I think the fact that I'm, I'm supporting students I think it's good that I can um, understand empathize what it's like to be a part-time student and everything like that and I can say that you know, the, the, the journey is tough but the, the the end result is worth it and here am I saying that I'm a doctor because a doctor of psychology um, not medicine, so let's, let's not get confused here. Okay? <laughs> Is there a doctor on the plane? Oh, maybe yeah, not. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yes. So, so it, it was a big, a big achievement. I, I, brilliant, I, brilliant. I, I so. Sorry, but, your third, per uh, your third one of the world then is a person, and this is somebody I uh, forgive my ignorance. I hadn't heard of. So this is a guy called Albert Kuschlek. Now, yes. is, he, is he somebody that you um, 
became aware of before receiving your doctorate or, or after then? It was when I was studying for my master's degree. Mm-hmm. I mean, when, when, I was, when I was kind of, well, who would I th- think of? You know, can I, I mean, so many people that have influenced me. I mean, Viktor Frankl comes to mind, you know, Men's Search for Meaning. There's so many people who, when I was studying to be a uh, school psychologist, I went to this uh, lecture by Albert Kuschlick, and he's a guy that helped introduce Portage, which is like a, a system for supporting children and families with quite profound and multiple difficulties. So, you know, very, you know, kind of when the national curriculum came out, it didn't go down far enough. It excluded these children, almost as if they, you know, they, they weren't ready to be on a curriculum. And, and Portage was like saying there is a curriculum for these children. They can learn, they can make progress. And when I, when I came across Albert, he, I suppose in a way he was, he, he was a me I wanted to be. I mean, he had energy, he had passion, he, he informed, he entertained, he inspired. And I can just, you know, kind of remember listening to him and, and, and thinking to myself, if I could be a little bit like this man, if I could be a little bit like Albert, and, and he's passed on now kind of thing. I met his wife and was able to say that he, he just kind of, he, he, was, he was food for support. He almost like said to me that you can, you can study, you can be an academic, but you can also, you know, um, not entertain, but you, you, the way you put ideas across can engage people. That, you, you know, you, you don't have to be patronizing, but you, you, can have, you can have, learning should be fun. You know, we haven't got the answers. We're on a, you know, a, a quest all the time. There's new understandings coming out. And I, I, you know, I've been, you know, I'm surrounded by books, you know, I'm looking at evidence-based practice and, you know, is it as good as it seems to be? And, and then I'm learning there are different methods of inquiry and whatnot. So, so Albert almost was, was that part that said it was okay to be the way that I was going. Because as a, as a teacher, I'd been someone who would, you know, pop into the cupboard to give a talk or stand on a desk or, you know, suddenly wrong foot people and say, you know, that th- this is still, we're still on task, but we need to engage with it. We need to be in the moment. And as I'm talking to you, I feel that kind of, you know, everything else about me has just fallen away. And all, all I'm engaged with now is being here with you. And I feel that, you know, that when you, when you, when I give talks and whatnot, the people, that they need to see that it's not just an idea you're putting across. It's a kind of it's a radical way of looking at the world. You know, when I tr- when when I go into schools and kind of they learn some of my mantras and whatnot, and I and I realise that I've nudged them to think about things a little differently. That they 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 suddenly kind of can see that perhaps there is an alternative way of understanding it. So I just don't want techniques. I want I get an understanding that informs the technique. So did you see him, did you just see him speak or did you, did you then grow on, get, go on to get to know him and work with him? I got to know him a bit better, but the, um, in a sense that I, I often then went to give talks at Portage, which was the, so every year they would go to Northampton and uh, book a, a big hotel and he would be kind of a core organiser and they would invite the parents and the children along. And then I would be doing like a workshop on communication or something like that, yeah? But you, were, I suddenly became in, involved with, you know, kind of uh, parents and children and other professionals who were kind of trying, trying to help people that, you know, they didn't ask for the challenges they were given, but now they, were, they needed kind of ideas and support to say, you know, your child has a right to be who they are. They have a right to engage and, you know, enjoy life and, yeah? And, and there are ways and techniques that Portage reached down and said, we can help you. And, and Albert was a, a, a Portage from America, a town in America, I think. But Portage is to carry. You have to carry. So Albert was just, he was just a figure. When I look back and I think of how I became the kind of psychologist I became, he, he was a significant kind of encourager, supporter for me to be the way I was developing. Yeah, it sounds like um, in your in your work, I'm guessing it's quite quite um, quite a, a sort of double act in the sense that you you need to have good quality ideas and be putting across something that's of value. But equally, when you're presenting to a room of a thousand people, you there's no point pretending that it's not important how you present that um, and and the idea that you can present that in a way that is like you said, fun and engaging, even if the topic is how do we support people that, uh, you know, who've experienced lots of difficulty, 
it's, sure. it's, it's, it's forgivable to have a bit of fun whilst talking about that that idea is that absolutely fair? yes very yeah. fair okay so your next um one with the world is a book and i I hadn't read this book before, Rob, and I genuinely feel like I could sort of quite happily pause right now and step out and do a whole separate podcast just about this book. Because so I, I got a massive thank you for you uh, uh, for for um, suggesting this to me or throwing it my way. And it is a book called Humankind by Rutger Bregman. I hope I've done that. Yes, I think he's yeah. a Dutch fellow, isn't he? So yes. before I start ranting on and on about what I got out of this book, you tell me what 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 makes it special for you. Well, it's got a little interesting story to it. I, I taught psychology in Exeter back in the 80s. And about two, three months ago, I somebody found me on the internet. Uh, a, an ex-student found me, Katrina. And she emailed me and said that, you know, do I remember her? And I taught her psychology. And um, now in, in psychology, there are kind of classic experiments there's kind of uh, the prisoner you know by Zimbardo about these people that go over the top when they're in the role of a, 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 a guard kind of thing um, there's uh, uh, the the robber's cave by sheriff and sheriff where these children get into a kind of um, holiday camp and end up going you know vicious towards each other and everything and there's Milgram with the electric shocks and everything yeah. and Katrina emailed and said I just read this book and this book kind of challenges people i was i was teaching you know kind of zimbardo milgram and sheriff and here's kind of um uh, evidence-based you know kind of support for the ideas that kind of you know human nature is pretty you know negative and things like that yeah and she said you, you need to look at this book because so i got back in touch with her and said i do remember you and it was it was really good because i did remember her. i even remember the the other students she sat alongside so that i mean it was really genuine and you know true and everything but I, I got the book and so that's how I came across the book because I hadn't, I hadn't heard of it kind of thing yeah so I thought well she, she's she obviously you know was thinking of me as she was reading this thinking that what Rob Long was telling us was, was not true you know because when I when he got into the book I mean I immediately it engaged with me because you know he starts off by contrasting I don't know how far you got with the book because it's the size of I've, it I've just finished it finished it yesterday yeah all right okay so, so he starts off by contrasting Thomas Hobbes, you know, you know, man's life is nasty, brutish and short, against Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was my spirit, you know, man is born free, yet he is everywhere in chains. You know, I mean, Rousseau was the noble savage. So in that book, he's immediately, you know, put in two, two totally different views together. And he talks about planet A and planet B, you know, kind of whether people are nasty and vicious and everything like that. So how I came across it was via this ex-student. And then as I was reading, you know, the kind of the way um, Lord of the Fly, you know, all of this is refreshment to you now, isn't it? Yeah, the, the Lord of the Fly story that was that, that novel suggested that, you know, children would go wild. But then that island that he came across, Atar Island and whatnot, yeah, where those two children had been there as a real life experiment, they did not go vicious towards each other. So, so it started to chime in with me the kind of you know human nature is not the negative side you know so you know i mean i'm not saying i embraced everything in the book but a lot of it i thought yes this guy is on my wavelength yeah but as a psychologist it may be questioned that some of the some of the ideas that you know we take we take this you know, you know kind of uh, pavlov was ringing bells i don't think pavlov owned a bell you know, I think if you go back to, you know, the primary, yeah, I think it's a myth, yeah? So there's lots of things that are handed down and everything. And what he did in that book, he went back to the kind of actual studies and found that Zimbardo was actually encouraging the, the guards to be more violent, yeah, yes? So the whole thing was like constructed. So he had a hypothesis in the beginning that he wanted to support. Well, that's not true inquiry, is it? So anyway, yeah. so yeah. Yeah, so it's definitely for, for anybody who's interested in psychology, social psychology, there's definitely a massive chunk of the book for me, which was just 
sort of asking asking you to sort of look again at things that you thought that you understood or thought that you knew and i i mean i've just written a list here so there's the, the, the famous experiments that you've talked about he he breaks down the kitty genovese um incident yes where yes, where the girl was murdered and 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 offers a completely different perspective on that um and 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 the other stuff that i've actually loved so i'm you know malcolm gladwell gets a good reappraisal stephen pinker's book um the sapiens book a lot of those sort of I say big books, not necessarily that they are long, although quite often they are, but books that are about big ideas or big topics. He basically asks you to relook at those. And generally speaking, he, when he does that, it's, it's to put a more positive spin on the explanations of, of human character than have been previously yes. offered. Is that fair? Fair, fair yes. summation of, of what's happening? Yes. Then he's got a few things that he says where he sort of just, um, for me, just hit the nail on the head of or managed to um sort of uh, explain something an idea that i've been coming to myself and then he manages yeah. to explain it far better than i could have done so he, he has the bit where he um talks about the damages of of, of um reading the news and, and yeah. absorbing the news and how bad that can be on your your outlook which is is sort of something that i'd sort of come to a conclusion that i'd come to a few months ago uh, probably at the height of the covid situation i remember yeah. thinking I just I need to be getting off off the you know off the internet basically and, and reading a lot less. So that was really nice to read him, yeah. To, you know to hear him sort of giving some sort of yeah. quality ideas behind that. And then I loved the bit about um, something that I hadn't heard of before, which is called contact theory, which is the yes. idea that if you get different groups um, and you Alcourt, Gordon Alcourt is that is that where that comes from? Yeah. And if you yeah. basically if, so if you take different groups, social groups the one thing that is almost sort of universally proven to bring them together is if they have more contact with each other. Yeah. Um, which again, when I, when you look around at how polarized things seem right now, I found that whole idea really reassuring, but also quite potentially illuminating to see a way out of the sort of ridiculous yeah. tug of wars that we find ourselves in sometimes. Yeah. So that, that, that I love that Robert. That was really good. But see, Seth, what you've had is what I often have. It's almost as if you have a kind of, um, you, you're, it's, it's not a thought in language yet. You know, it's, it's there, but, you, you know, you, you struggle to express it, yeah? And then you suddenly read a, a book like this and it crystallizes your thought. Suddenly you've got a language for it and you suddenly, they don't have to say, it's what you wanted to say. And this person has helped you find the words for it. And I mean, and that's, that's what I was getting, you know, going back to Harley kind of thing, but, and, and I still get it now, is that when I read someone and it suddenly, it, it, I knew it, but I, I couldn't express it, but now mm. it's been put into words kind of thing, which, which is, see, I mean, I kind of, Wittgenstein, I mean, I, I can't help but quote you, the limits of my world is the limit of, uh, limits of my language. So it's, it's having the language to express ourselves, yeah? And yeah. that's what good writers like that. Uh, and, he, and he crystallized a lot of my thinking, yeah? And I, I, it's magic. It's yeah, magic. really, really good. There's, there's a couple of bits in there, another, a few little bits about things that I just didn't know about. And you just think, this is just criminal that, that we're not yes. all taught this stuff. So. For example, the whole thing that happened in, in Denmark where during the Holocaust, where basically, from what he, he says, they basically, as a country en masse, basically decided that, that, that the Jewish people were going to be, you know, um, saved, yeah. basically. That, that is just an incredible piece of history that, that I've never been taught. There's um, the real life Lord of the Flies bit that you talked about, where basically he takes this sort of case study of these boys who actually got stranded yeah. on, a, on an island, and rather than killing each other, they just work life out and i mean that is just a, one, a wonderful little a little piece of knowledge and then um this right at the end he just drops in this um this thing about how in in germany they had um uh, i think it's a place called uh, 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 it's i want to pronounce it Wichmann, and they had um neo-nazis started holding annual walks yeah. to yeah. to celebrate um this it was some sort of nazi historical event and so the local people turned it into a sponsored walk. That's and, right. no, no. And, and, <laughs> and were measuring how far they were walking and, and giving money to, to charity based on it. And you just think this is I, just I, absolutely I, incredible. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of ideas in the book that I found a little bit challenging that I was really sort of eager to discuss with you. So 
one of the things he talks about is, um, you know, you, you, like you said earlier, this Hobbes versus Rousseau sort of, you know, clash. Yeah. And, and basically the fact that the ideas of that you need a state and you need laws to regulate all these people who are inherently bad, um, which is, is, is a really appealing idea and a much more positive way of looking at life. I, I then, when I then start to think that through into real life situations, that's when I find that more difficult. So uh, the example I was thinking of is the internet, and I'd be interested to know this, your view on this also with your sort of child psychologist hat on. So I want to believe that, you know, fundamentally people are good and you don't, you don't need to regulate them because if you treat them, you know, maturely, they will act maturely and, you know, we don't need to come yeah. in with, with rules and all that. But then I was thinking about the internet, I think, you well, know, the internet right now, to me, looks like something that needs a leviathan. It needs, it needs a regulatory power because if, you, if it's left as it is at the moment, it's just got too much opportunity for bad people to, to do bad things or, you know, to exploit people. So tell me where I've gone wrong there, Rob, or what's, what's the difference? <laughs> No, no, I, th I think in, in the real world where, where you've got kind of, um, you know, the, the systems that we live under, I mean, I think you can try to apply some of these principles in your own little kind of um, area, but when you take it outside of that, there's a kind of world where kind of profit, you know, kind of the drive to succeed, the kind of materialism, everything like that is, is what, you know, kind of you, you then end up with kind of the ideas of, I don't know, Eric Fromm, where kind of, yeah, your 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 self definition is by what you own. Yeah, you know how successful you are is kind of how much you get paid and everything. Yeah, so you've got like a system that has kind of taken away from people the 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 altruism that they inherently have to say that no, you're going to be measured by what you own, what you got, and everything like that. So I think when you when you you, you know you, you can only control you know you can only change what you've got some control over. So I, th I think, you know, I kind of, um, there's a book I just read about um, Maui on, on Tuesdays, I've forgotten his name, but a guy who's terminally ill and whatnot, but it, almost like saying that kind of, you try to make a difference where you can. So when you then look out through the internet, you can't apply the same, you haven't got the control over it. And you've got children that we've allowed access to things I would say are beyond the developmental you know, appropriateness and stage of many children. Therefore, you need to have you know, guidelines, limitations and whatnot. Otherwise, I think you would be irresponsible. So yeah. I, I, kind of, I can read it and it's part of me that kind of, it echoes back into a kind of uh, a utopian vision of you know, how, how you know, we think it could be. But then I say, well, you, you, if you go back and think of change, the, the, the tension that people like us are saying, it isn't right, it could be better, gradually we're forcing them to say, you need to have limitations on it. You can't in the world as it is, just put this out and allow you know, children to have access to these kind of things, you know, whether it's you know, self-harming websites and things like that. Yeah, it would be morally, to me as a, you know, a child psychologist, I would say reprehensible. So I, th I think you, you have to, you know, the, the world is so complex that you can't just take those ideas and say, okay, let it be. And that kind of things will turn out for the best because, you know, I mean, the book in a way shows that people like Zimbardo and whatnot twisted the truth to suit them. So, so you know, the, the very people that we turn to for guidance and whatnot. I, mean, I don't know if you remember, I mean, kind of Cyril Bird was a guy who argued that, um, you know, intelligence was innate and he had these um, identical twins that had been separated and whatnot. He never studied twins. He, it was all fiction. It was terrible. He was knighted and whatnot. But the, the arguments, he knew, he knew what it should be like. So he said, I just found these twins. He, he even got a female, he fantasized, no, created a female college to write a paper supporting his ideas. She was a fantasy. So, so I think, you know, once you go out into the outside world, I think, you know, you, know, kind of, you, you have to take a, a, a reality perspective on it, yes? So we're allowed, to hang on, we're allowed to hang on to a bit of cynicism there. I'm taking that. Yeah. So the other idea that really interested me, so he talks about the fact that for 95% of human history, we lived in these small hunter-gatherer groups and the sort of, you know, the, the way that we live now was actually relatively new. And he talks about the fact that in those small groups, a big way that behavior, human behavior was regulated was through shame. So basically, if somebody got a bit too above their station or somebody started being greedy, 
they would be forced to be, um, you know, they, they'd be made to feel shame, basically. They would be shunned from the group, outcast yes. a little bit. And that was a way of, of everyone's behavior being regulated so that you didn't get tyrants and, you know, right. you didn't get yes. uh, people looked upon into So then I started thinking, that's quite interesting because the way that, you know, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of the school of thought of people who work with children these days would be that, generally shame is a bad thing you know we don't try and do anything that makes children feel shame and if children act in a certain way the the, the sort of impulse is to you know we might want to talk to them and reason them through or you know have a conversation but we wouldn't try and encourage a child to feel shame and there's a sort of a nugget in this book an idea that suggests that actually um shame is a useful way of children or people learning to regulate their own behavior so how would you sort of square that circle for me rob <laughs> that's a tough one i think so that's a tough one because i think i mean shame you, you get some um emotions like which are social constructions yeah i mean when you look at the kind of uh, in the primitive setup we would have had you know um uh, emotions such as anger anxiety fear yes so shame becomes like a social construction doesn't it it's because you know as we develop language and we live more collectively we to develop you know so his argument that we develop shame as a way of keeping people in order i mean and, and ostracizing them if they are they're not I, I kind of I I I don't I don't take that view with children. I take that view that you're trying to help children learn. Children make behavioural mistakes. I hate that a child that feel ashamed that they got something wrong. I, I would feel that's that's terrible. I mean, that's putting like a an adult perspective on a child who's still got L plates on for heaven's sake. So I mean, I, th I think that, that to me, I mean, that's why in some parts of the book, I was thinking I'm not really going. To totally along with this you know you know that, that there's much more uh, complexity to it you know in terms of psychological development stage of awareness you know development of language reasoning all those kind of things and to just say so even for some adults so there will be some adults that they make you know behavioral mistakes yeah I mean that's just looking at the surface behavior you know, what is the motive behind it and sometimes the motive behind it was nothing but you know you know he, he, you're interpreting it as being kind of one up and you know trying to dominate others it might be someone you know just misread the cues or has got a lower level of understanding of social interactions and whatnot and then the thought the thought of turning shame onto them and I'm, I'm sorry i i, I would be um you know, I, I can see it is adult life that, that they're, they're, we are led to feel that there are some things that are socially, you know, we should be embarrassed about and shamed, ashamed of, yeah, because we violated. But when you and I think about children, I mean, I, I think years ago I worked with children, um, with people who have kind of sexual behaviours in young children. And he was trying to say, well, the adults are not understanding the stages of development that children go through as they become sexually mature. And so therefore, you know, if you haven't got like a, a framework, I mean, I would suggest that in some areas, he hasn't got a framework of kind of understanding of like child development to say that that kind of model is one that ought to work. No, so I, 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 I mean, I'd have to go back to the book again, but I know there was chunks in it that I thought, no, no, that, you know, for me, you know, you know sometimes I, I read a book and I think I would love to have written this. I would have loved to have written chapters in this book, but not the entire book. I think I suppose it's, it's a, a good place to end it in the sense that that is the merit of the book. So it's although there are bits of it that are very agreeable, it's not a complete yes. agree on. It's not a good. It, there is it's challenging and makes you think things differently, yeah. even if you don't agree with it. So that is why I, 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 I am at the, at the very end when he gives this kind of. Um, you know, ideas of how to live a life mm. in one. I mean, I, I like to kind of, you know, expect the best. Mm. You know, I, I've travelled, you know, with my family, we did house exchanges, you know, things like that, yeah, on, on the assumption that people weren't coming to our house to rip it, you know, that they were good people, like we were good people. Yeah. So, I, you know, I've always approached the kind of, not everyone is out to mug you, for heaven's sake, but then I feel sorry for some people who approach life like that, I, you know, and that, yeah. that's... A, it's a tough world when they think that everyone is negative. Yeah, I, th I think there is more good. I mean, that's what I like about the book. There, there is more good that we're not recognizing. And that's why I love the 
the, I mean, I've been doing some webinars and whatnot about positive psychology, that with all this COVID going on, I, I'm, I'm all for kind of helping children cope with anxiety, but I also want teachers in the classroom to think of, let's celebrate, what's the, what's the positive stuff? Where's the good emotions? Because just as negative emotions turn us into self-defend, you know, anger turns us in, you know, kind of self-protect and everything. I mean, having joy, curiosity, happiness, all those things lead us out into the world. So I think we've got to make sure at this difficult time that we're also helping children to want to, you know, recognise their strengths to take them forward. Very timely, very timely. Very timely. So your fifth wonder of the world then is um, a film. It's the last picture show, which was filmed in, released in 71 and set in the 50s. It's a sort of coming of age film. Um, based in a small town in Texas that sort of follows three teenagers. Um, I have to say, Rob, I found this film a little bit sad. Um, so you tell me why you've chosen it as your wonder of the world, your fifth wonder of the world. Well, because I also wanted to have young Frankenstein, remember? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, is, it is a sad, yeah? But then, then see, um, I'm just looking to the side and there's a book on the floor which is like the, the third wave of positive psychology which is accepting the dark side. So I, I don't, I, I, I felt it was, it, you know, was depressing. The town ended up, you know, kind of with unemployment and the cinema closes down and everything like that. But I, I think that that's part of life, you know, the, the, the transitions the young people were going through, you know, losing their kind of um, innocence and everything like that. I, I felt, I, I'm, I'm a Leonard Cohen man. Okay. You know, I mean, I, I can't, I don't see anything dark and depressing. You know, my, my wife does and other people do, but I, I, I don't, you know, the dark side, it, that's life. That's life. In the book I've just been read, it was the story, it was kind of, um, the farmer had his horses stolen and his neighbour came around and said, that's bad news. And the farmer said, maybe. And the following morning, the horses came back with a couple of wild ones. And the neighbour came around and said, well, that's good news. And then the farmer said, maybe. And then his son tried to break in one of the wild horses, fell off and broke his leg. And the neighbour came around and said, that's bad news. And the farmer said, maybe. And the following day, the recruiting officer for the army came around looking for young men to join the army to go to war. And he couldn't because he had a broken leg. So the, it's, it's almost like kind of the, 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 the dark side is part of the light. You know, you can't have one without the other. So, so that film was like a, a, a reality film. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I, I it's quite it. gritty, isn't it? It's quite gritty yeah. in that sense. Yes. It's and you've got, yeah, because you've got people who went on to be, you know, very this, but it, it, it reminded me of my kind of um, adolescence when I was kind of, I should have been in studying like my dad wanted me to, but I was more interested to be out growing up and meeting folk, you know, so there, there, there was that kind of uh, tension. And it I, just, feel like, um, I feel like meeting folk covers a multitude of sins there. Well, yes, exactly. Well, I could go into that, Seth, but I, mean, I think It'll save you a lot of time if I haven't got to explain it in too much detail. So, but I mean, nudity, I mean, kind of for heaven's sake, it was young people growing up. Yeah. You, and, you know, and people that looked at that and thought it was that kind of film. Well, okay, didn't you grow up? I mean, are you trying to say that you're different from the rest of us? And it was, then he was tarred with the kind of, you, you had the lad with the kind of uh, learning difficulties, okay, yeah. You, you had the guy who was trying to, you know, develop the, the cinema. So there, there, there was sadness in it. But I, I think you, you, need, you need to embrace the dark. You know, this, this kind of stay happy, you know, the society where, you know, if you're not happy, there's something wrong. Well, hold on, you know. I mean, part of our, our, our basic biological condition, what, why this pandemic is having such an effect is because we are predisposed to be anxious because we can imagine tomorrow i mean when a zebra when a zebra is chased by a lion and it escapes it doesn't then go and have a chat with its mates and say well that was a close one i'm gonna really be careful tomorrow it just immediately starts eating the grass again but whereas with us we can think well what might happen and so we can generate the anxiety yes so we live in a kind of yeah deferred yeah 
Lovely. So yeah, it was, it was, but that's why I also wanted Young Frankenstein because I mean, Mel Wilder, and I think your dad knows where I'm coming from, that there's, you know, there's, there's taste here and, you know, Mel Brooks, you know, kind of, um, uh, Young Frankenstein is a family film for us with uh, Gene Wilder and kind of, yeah, Martin. You probably won't, so you probably won't realise this, but the reason I had to push you down the, the last picture show uh, route was because actually it's very hard to watch a copy of, um, Mel Brooks is Young Frankenstein. It's not, it's not readily available on your, um, you know, your streaming right. providers, I'm afraid. So that's why we had to go yeah. there. Mel Brooks was interviewed and, and they said, what would you like to be remembered for? And he thought for a moment, he said, I'd like to be remembered as being a lot taller than I was. <laughs> it's a good, great line. Okay. So if I, if I was slightly um, bemused by your last picture show, as in it left me feeling a little bit flat, if anything, your, your sixth one of the world, your album, um, I think went about six feet over the top of my head. Um, so you cho you've chosen Under Milk Wood, which is a, a 50s, 1950s radio drama uh, written by Dylan Thomas. And I, I feel like I completely, completely missed this, Rob. So tell me what I missed. Because I've listened to it and I've listened to it again and I've listened to it again and I feel like I don't know I don't know what's going on. Well, it's life, isn't it? It's life in a little village, and it's Dylan Thomas with and Richard Burton reading it, and all the characters and Blind Captain Cat and all all the different folk in it, and Organ Morgan, a no good boy who wants to be a good boy but nobody let him. You know, the, I mean, it was just the the, the use of language. The use of language and kind of there's so many different characters in it you know hopes you know this the sailor's arms are always open oh my van we my van we oh yeah I, I just i i kind of i had it as a teenager and i fell asleep to it night after night after night Hello. and it was just that kind of the accent the kind of you know because we're a musical nation you know kind of the language the language so i, I suppose the fact that you know it doesn't you know it kind of it's, I, I suppose for its time kind of thing. I mean, I, mean, I was thinking, you know, I, Bob Dylan I loved and Leonard Cohen I liked, but you can kind of think Dylan Thomas, you know, he caught like kind of real life, you know, kind of, he caught stories of people, you know, kind of, who kind of, uh, the, 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 the ones that were dead, the ones that were dreaming, the young, the old, yes. Um, and they, they were comical characters. And I, I just, I just loved the lilting sound of it. And to begin at the beginning, where else would you begin? Yes, uh, I, kind of, I, I wouldn't, my son brought a kind of uh, a record player, so I actually, yesterday, because I knew I was going to do this, I was able to put it on and sit and listen to it, you know, because I've had the, uh, the box, you know, kind of set and everything, but not been able to play it for quite some time. So we actually brought a record player over and we set it up. And I, I think there were other members of the family that, Perhaps six foot is perhaps extreme, but it was way, way over there. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a personal wonder. I, I didn't know if I was being sympathetic to myself I, um, or, you know, lenient on myself. I feel like maybe there's a slight element of, for my generation, the idea that you would listen to an audio as a form of entertainment <laughs> is, is in of itself quite bizarre. I can remember my dad trying to play me. Um, vinyl recordings of Monty Python and, and stuff like that and I just yeah. I just I couldn't get it I was like there's no visuals here dad what's happening I don't I couldn't right. it, it was just so removed from what I was you know used to yeah. so may, maybe there's a slight element of that yeah oh. the, the blood donor Tony Hancock and things like that yes yeah yes yeah. So again there, there's things that I've had you know family members older family yeah. members talking about but no, they've missed the boat completely. So, but I would, you know, it definitely wasn't, um, it wasn't normal or it wasn't boring. I'd, I'd give it both of those things. So it's definitely, if anybody's listening, I would definitely recommend giving them a work, giving it a whirl, um, okay. even if only for intrigue. So your last wonder of the world then, because I don't want to keep you any longer than I promised to. Your last wonder of the world is um, your possession. And it is, you've written down here, it is an oil can from your father. So tell us about this wonderful oil can oh. i i struggled well when when you said you know a possession and whatnot it took, it took a long time um I, I i just couldn't think of anything that really 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 i kind of valued enough to say you know i want to rush into the house to save that kind of thing you know i, I couldn't 
So then in the garage and whatnot, I've always had this oil can. And I suppose I've, I've not got many mementos from my parents. Um, and it's just, that, and I've got some photos and everything, but this oil can, I suppose when I, when I sat and looked at it, I then put myself back in the family with my mum, with my dad, and my dad, who was kind of um, a, a fixer, a doer, you know, kind of, he would build things, he would do things. My mum, you know, was a working mum, a working class mum. I, you know, with this pandemic going on kind of thing, it brings back memories of the, the polio pandemic, yeah? And I, I was a victim of polio. So kind of, you know, going back to 1950, you know, there, there was a um, massive, before the vaccinations, you know, came in, I was um, kind of affected by polio. So my mum taking me to hospital and, you know, kind of, uh, and all, all, the, all the things that they as a family, you know, kind of was one of three and everything, but I had this kind of disability that they were there helping me to become the kind of man that I, I became, yeah? I mean, when some people say, well, you, you inherit your, by, your, your personality, your intelligence, I often just want to say to them, so if you were brought up by the people next door, do you think you'd be the same person? And I think we'd all say, well, well, no, I couldldn't be, could I? And I think, you know, the oil can, it, it's just, it, it could have been something else, but, you know, it, it kind of was placing me back in the family with my own personal challenges and them supporting me that when I look back and think about the way that I became, they were instrumental in that. And it was kind of, uh, you know, when I was hard pushed to think, well, but, you know, uh, there's nothing really, uh, I'm not materialistic. I, you know, I, I should have a haircut more often for heaven's sake. I mean, look, you know, kind of my ties and my extravagance and whatnot. But I mean, kind of, I am in part a product of my family and my mum and dad, who with the, the polio thing and everything, they, they helped me to still push on, to not be condemned to be a, a clock, because I was sitting down all day and everything like that. And the oil can just some, I've even thought of ways of trying to polish it up. But my son said, no, you should keep the, the patana or whatever, you know, keep, keep it looking as it is. But um, it, it was symbolic. Yeah, well, the idea behind this podcast is kind of a little bit like in, in rough times, let's look for some things to be grateful for. And that sounds exactly like your oil can, really, in that, you know, yeah. a, a, a time when you were dealing with a personal challenge, you had people that that um that you were lucky to have to help you through that so i'm going to take that as a very fitting end to uh our episode today rob Rob, it's been an absolute pleasure thank you ever so much for joining us on uh wonders of the world i hope you've uh found it um positive experience yeah i have i have and thank you very much for inviting me and good okay like to find out more about today's guest or the wonders of the world podcast then you can check out our website or get involved in all the usual social media nonsense wonders of the world is a borderline niche production we would just like to say thank you for listening